Okay, here we go. Yeah. My guest today is Todd Lemieux, and I hope I have this right. Yeah. He's an ex-Canadian Air Force Reserve pilot, an air show performer. He's flown all types of aircraft, military and civilian roles. I'm super stoked to have you here today to hear a lot about your aviation history and other things. Yeah, you bet. Good, awesome. to, good to be here. Thanks, man. Yeah, so the a little bit of uh, reserve flying uh, as a kid, teaching teaching other kids. I think I was 18 at the time, teaching 16-year-olds how to fly gliders. Um, and then the air show stuff is all airplanes that I owned and that. Um, and the re I think I was in the reserves for seven years. Got I wanted to camping. ask you, I have a few questions just so I can never remember, but where did you get the flying bug and how old do you think you were and where were we and you got it? When did you know you're seriously going to become a like a real deal pilot? Yeah, when I... Well, I grew up in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. So, you know, with the snowbirds practiced over the house. Our, we were on downwind right for runway oh, 28 perfect. in Moose Jaw. And you got to remember in the 1980s and 70s growing up there, those guys had 100 tutors on the line every morning. And there's three three or four flights, uh, flights meaning like squadrons, like 12 airplanes. They were each. burning like, fuel like mad there. They run, it was, it was the it was second only to Pearson International Airport for landings and takeoffs. It was yeah. Moose, CFB Moose Jaw. Awesome. So there'd be a hundred tutors airborne all the time. They'd ran, they ran two uh, circuits, like downwind right and downwind left on the two parallels. So the jets were in the air constantly. So you're sort of there, plus it's the home of the snowbirds. And so as a kid, I just, you know, you're watching them all the time and grew up on a farm totally cool. on a John Deere tractor and you're kind of like... Uh, you hope you can do something like that. So I ended up joining uh, Air Cadets when I was in high school, 1984. That'll date me. And uh, did that for a year and then applied to uh, get my gliding license. They sent me to Gimli, Manitoba, and I got my gliding license. Uh, this Gimli summer. Glider, same place? Same place. Yeah. yeah, that happened in 1983 or 82. Might be wrong. A few years were before we were there, before okay. I got my license there. And they still had reunions in the summer times. So mm -hmm. Bob Pearson would come out. They had a big Icelandic festival and a parade, and the flight crew came out, and they still sort of honored them. Yeah, cool. Uh, that's a legendary thing. They actually that airplane didn't land on the runway. It landed, it landed on a racetrack, the, the old or runway, which is a racetrack, like a quarter mile track. That's right. Yeah. Their and the nose gear collapsed, which is what saved them. They actually got them stopped. Got them slowed yeah. down enough before they yeah. go off the end. Yeah. Really. So that's. Yeah. I only I've heard a little bit about it, but that's a. Yeah, that's a good story. Sort of like circular stuff there, right? Like the guy that was in the right seat of the 767. So they took off out of uh, Montreal, going to Edmonton. They did a kilograms to pounds conversion error and ran out of fuel in northern Ontario at 40,000 feet or so yeah. and started the glide towards Winnipeg. Knew they couldn't make Winnipeg. They were too far north of track. And the first officer had trained and flown t-33s at a gimli uh, he perfect. knew he knew where gimli was and they chose it and they committed to it so that's why because there's no gimli. nearest button back then probably probably not they would have had a, like a, a laser ins in the <laughs> but you thing know that today yeah. you just go dearest yeah. it tells well, exactly G where GPS it is. didn't exist know, right so um that's that's that's, that's it was sort of indigenous knowledge to have up his sleeve that past experience yeah. Yeah. and then they they rolled out on the runway and at altitude, they, they didn't know that that was a racetrack. He hadn't been there since the 60s or whatever. They got eyes on it. They're like, that's got to be it. Once you're committed, you're committed. And he side-slipped it in to land. So it's it's a pretty amazing he story. He side-slipping because he, he was too high? Yeah. By they, the time he they were actually too high seen it? And they had to get down. So you got one shot. There's not enough altitude to go around to yeah. circle. So he side-slipped it. And, and Bob Pearson, and I think I got his name right, was a glider pilot. He, he owned a... A, a sailplane. They're, at North they're used to having the power off. Yeah. That's good. So the right guys to be at the helm yeah. for that kind of situation. That's yeah. awesome. That's something else, really, when you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, every, that's and everybody walked away. They all walked away. Yeah. No, I don't think there was any injuries. Not at even all. like a maybe a bumper or bruise or neck airplane. or something. They were worried about fire, I think, when yeah. they rolled out. Yeah. But so that's Gimli, and then I came back uh, the year after in nineteen eighty five and did my power license out of Gimli as well. Um, that's where they sent us to do that. And that was through the Air Force? Through the cadets. Through the cadets. So that's a scholarship. You compete to get the scholarship. Oh, okay. Write exams, interviews. It's a pretty lengthy process. And then they usually choose one from each squadron in Canada. Very limited. Yeah. In Western Canada, there would have been 
um, 12 or 15 of us. I can't remember on the course. Right. So it, you had to compete for what it. What kind of aircraft were they using? Uh, that's, so it was all contracted to civilian flying clubs. It's sort of based on the World War II model where they initially did stuff with the civilian flying clubs. Yeah. Um, so you competed for the scholarship. And then um, when you got there, the pressure was on, though. You had to get the license completed in the uh, five weeks that you were there. That's a so, short time. Yeah, you fly a lot. You fly often. We'd fly three trips a day with ground school in the mornings or the afternoons. So they'd have to take the twelve kids, divided into six each. Ground school in the morning for the first six, while the other guys fly if yeah. the weather's good. Switch it up in the afternoon, and then often in the evenings as well. Um, so you pound out. I think at that time the license was forty hours ish. That's a lot of flying in five weeks. Yeah, it's intense, and yeah. people fail. Oh, for sure. For sure. We probably lost, I guess we lost three people in my it took course. took me a year and a half to get my pilot's license. Yeah, and that's Between norm- work and all yeah, that Yeah, and that's because you got other stuff on the yeah. go. This is, you're there to, to learn to fly, yeah. and uh, they treat it really seriously. A good way um, to do it, though. I think. Yeah, I'm glad I learned that way. I often tell, uh, you know, and I'm sure you do too, they get a lot of people like, oh, I'd like to learn to fly. You know, they kind of muse about it. And I always tell them, go find a school where you can go take two months off of your life and go park go yourself live and live at it and fly that's that recency and currency is is really valuable yeah I'm, I'm glad i learned to fly that way there's that one place in manitoba i think or it's in saskatchewan harv's air harv's air yeah. yeah you go there you live at their dorms and that's right yeah. there's a they feed you give you a place to sleep and and train you just move right on in that's I, the best way to do it for i sure. think that's the way ahead and there's a lot of u.s flight schools that do that where yeah. they have deals with hotels or whatever and yeah. Like if you were going to go... Uh, Kissimmee, Florida. That's where I'd go. Yeah. <laughs> stay warm. <laughs> stay, stay warm. But the weather's usually not nice. Gi- not Gimli in January. <laughs> minus 40. But that's how that went. And then I, I got out of that and uh, came back to instruct on gliding. And that's when you join the reserves, right? So at that time, it was called the Cadet Instructors Cadre. Uh, you joined as an officer cadet. You get a commission in the Canadian military. And the only... The trick is you're not full-time. You're not even a full-time reservist, uh, so you just get paid for the summer, right? And then, so that allowed me to go to university. Oh, with okay. A, but I got you. Quite a few guys would join reg- regular the regular force and go to, like, Royal Roads Military College. But then College. you're committed. Yeah, and I I mean, I just, I, I don't know. I, I, like, I wanted to have fun in university, so I guess I made the decision to go to the University of Saskatchewan yeah. and have fun. But it was a great gig. You, you could come back and fly in the summers. You got to fly, you got to teach, and you got paid. And there's a whole, more importantly, you're surrounded, like my instructor that taught me to fly was in medical school and ended up being a flight surgeon in the military. Like you're sort of surrounded by these achiever type Mm -hmm. people. So it, it really sort of upped the bar for your performance. For sure. There was no question. It just, like, it seemed natural to go to university and do something because if you didn't, everyone would wonder, what are you doing? (laughs) What are you doing? (laughs) What are you doing, man? (laughs) So that's how that went. That's awesome. Yeah. What what did you do in university? Like uh, engineering of some type? Yeah, I did. I I started out. I did two years in engineering at the University of Saskatchewan, and I hated it. I was in mechanical engineering, and I was like, I got to get a degree to do something. And I loved the physics part of it. I'm a mm-hmm. 20 19 year old kid at the time. I, well, I went to university when I was 18, but uh, and I and I was like, oh, I got to finish something here. So I went in and took, uh, finished my physics degree and got the degree. At the time, I wanted was thinking about joining the military full time, and I wanted a degree at, in, back in those days, and I got it. And then I was like, "Holy crap! I can't get a job with a physics degree." There's I, nothing out there. There's nothing. There is unless you go the distance so and limited. get the PhD. Oh. So then I came back and I went, and this is 1989 ish. There were no jobs in Saskatchewan for sure. And even Alberta's oil patch was slow. So I went into the co-op program at the University of Regina, which was great. Uh, I got a job with the National Energy Board in Calgary um, as a co-op student. And then I went four months on, four months off, and I finished my engineering degree. Gotcha. So that introduced me to Calgary, introduced me to the oil patch, and uh, started to meet people out here. And I came out here after I graduated. And introduced you to a paycheck. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when I hear a lot of the National Energy Board stuff that's going on now with pipelines, I'm like, I roll my eyes a little bit because <laughs> having worked there as a student, you could see that uh, you could see that they did a lot of approvals and and 
like I think it was a good organization then, but I think it's changed a lot now. So right, right. anyway, and that brought me to Calgary. Cool. Um, <clears throat> I remember talking in a coffee shop with you like numerous times over the past couple of years yeah. since we met. Uh, you said you spent some time in Tudor Jets flying them. I got lots. Or do you get some rides? I got in. some rides. In. Oh, nice! Yeah. And a horn at one time. Got a got a ride in the F eighteen with a friend be of mine. Something else. Uh, we did a good trip, uh, a maple flag trip. So it was a sortie where everybody's flying. So you get the Americans are there, the Germans and the French, even the Israelis. I think I can't remember if they were there at that time, but uh, you, we launched with the Canadians in a two seat F eighteen. Their job was strike. And then you got the American F-15s that are doing combat air patrol above nice. you. But everybody launches the, all these about 70 airplanes take off at once. Wow. And they go into the target simulating something like the Kosovo War, something mm. like that. But also there's red air. So there's bad guys that are trying to shoot you down. There's, in this case, American F-16s that are playing that role. Yeah. And the Canadians roll in. I think our call sign was Molson. They have these Molson. beers call signs. <laughs> Maple but it, syrup. <laughs> but it's it's very, uh, it's really intense. Wow. Yeah, There's that's a lot cool. of airplanes around. Um, and sort of the, the good news and the bad news is that everybody launches at the same time, but they all run out of gas at the same time. Oh. So they got to all be recovered back in Cold Lakes. So you get, even the recovery process is complicated. I get Got all these airplanes ingressing. You got 70 out. aircraft want to land right now. Yeah. Wow. And they're all kind of similar in terms of fuel burn and all that. So, and then, so you, it takes all day to do the trip. You show up in the morning, prep, get your gear. You go to the briefing. Your, uh, the section commander guy goes and gets the big briefing, the big picture briefing. And he comes back to the airplanes that he's flying with and downloads that to them. Then you fly the trip, which takes lots of time, you know, it takes an hour, but it's an hour to get ready hour to fly hour to recover by the time you land and get back in yeah. and then everybody goes about three or four o'clock in the afternoon for the mass debrief the big big this is what went well this is what yeah and it's all automated so you good. can see each individual airplane on the screen and what they were doing and then right. they'll freeze frame it and they'll argue about that was a kill that wasn't a kill and then there's judges that'll be like no hmm. that was a kill so it, it's That's very cool. well orchestrated and it's training to go into theater for those guys right so that that was a really interesting it was fun to do that trip for sure did you get to break the sound barrier in no, the 18 they went no not we quite, didn't. Eh? i mean i think some guys have done you're it. close uh yeah Obviously. that mission i think that's a subsonic mission because uh, the canadians role in that strike package was to go in and drop bombs on target and right. come back um so you probably wouldn't do that with their war load on um but no I, we didn't do that but i mean it's kind of all relative it your you can see your airspeed readout and so on but um you just hear noise like it the the sense of velocity kind of disappears after a while because you're once you're going that fast all yeah. the time well and you're unless you're close to the ground and have yeah, that ground rush yeah. there's no uh reference <clears throat> so yeah even a big 747 you look out the window yeah it feels like you're it's, not even it's no different than that and that's probably roughly the same speeds we, yeah. we would go up to um, of course the airplane's capable of supersonic, but we didn't do that. Yeah. I wonder if they, do they, do you know if they do do supersonic a lot? Oh yeah. I Just think to they go do. at A to B. Yeah. They, they, I think, well, but not, do they do it, let's say in combat roles? Um, I think they'll do it up on the range as part of their training. Yeah. And, uh, you got to remember the fuel penalty will be very high for that. So they don't use it very often and they wouldn't use it, um, outside of typically outside of the range like yeah. to fly to edmonton for example because you're in there's no sense there. doing it no nah, the fuel penalty's high and yeah and also uh sonic booms on the ground do you remember any numbers of what those things burn in a let's say an hour i can't remember uh it'd be an awful amount of fuel right yeah I, I can't remember it's high i mean i, I want to say uh if i think about something like the t33 we're burning 16 17 1800 pounds per hour so i'm thinking the tutor would be a little less than that. And the, pounds. What kind of gallons or liters are we talking there? Uh, I got to do the math. It'd be uh, close. Yeah, you probably three hundred gallons an hour. Well, it's yeah, you know, something like that's, that. That's that's a lot of fuel. Yeah, yeah. At and buck, the, the, so the F fifteen would be quite a bit more than that, and way more than that in afterburner, right? Yeah, that'd so, be cool. 
Yeah. I'd like to see it. I'd like to do it. Yeah, it's... But it's not many a, people broke the... Well, there's there's a few civilians back in the day. The Concorde and... Yeah, this, the Concorde routinely broke the sound barrier, yeah. but they always did it out over the North Atlantic. And in fact, that was one of the things that kind of got it shut down because as they decelerated, they'd send out a sonic boom and people... Oh, they're the, coming back through? Or they're the coming York down area, through it? Yeah, they, they start to complain about noise. Yeah. So I think the next big... Those are cool planes. Yeah. They started working on those things like 20 years before the first one rolled out the factory door, right? That's right. It takes that yeah. much research. I think the Concorde and... first flew in 68. Yeah. And it was on, it was being worked on in the late 50s, probably. So. That's a, a heck of an airplane. Yeah, long gone yeah. now. But. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to also ask you, and we'll go, we'll go bounce back and forth between aviation and... Yep. But I want to ask you about the oil field business in Saskatchewan. I, I think it was like the Bakken field. Did you have something to do? Yeah, a little there? bit. Or we tell did. us a little bit about your oil patch career, oil field career. Yeah, I mean, I came to Calgary to, after my formal sort of education in engineering, and I worked for a company called Archer Resources. We did a lot of natural gas uh, drilling, shallow stuff. Natural gas was busy then. It was a really good company to be at. It had a lot of bright light bulbs in it, smart guys. A lot of people from that company went on to start other companies um, and uh, sort of cut my teeth there. They kind of just threw me in. We, we'd go out to the field, sit on the rigs, learn everything we could, come back to the office. So, I, you know, single guy, I, I worked a lot, <laughs> you know, like you, like they, you guys. They like would. the single guys because yeah. they know they can work them. <laughs> they can work yeah. them all the time. Uh, lots yeah. of times sitting <laughs> in uh, well shacks, watching filings come in and cuttings come in as you drill. And But really great place to learn. And and we did, because we managed our own areas, my first area was called Birch Wavy, which is like between Lloyd Minister and Stettler up in that area. Um, you get to know all the field operations, how plants operate, um, how the drilling rig works, how the service rig works, snubbing, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Like everything, it, it, you weren't pigeonholed because it was a small company. You did all your, your own accounting, your own AFEs, raise your own. That's the way to do it. Present your own projects. That's the way to learn. So that was really good. And then uh, there's a point where you, you're young and you're, you're kind of, you think you're smart enough to do it on your own. You're probably not. <laughs> you think you have the experience. We went and uh, I left and went to a company called Stellarton for a year. Uh, we worked, worked there again, a bunch of bright light bulb guys, really smart, innovative. Yeah. We, I worked a lot on trying to remove water from natural gas wells that were loading, prematurely loading. Um, did a couple conferences down in Texas with that. And, uh, while I was at Archer, I went to Louisiana and, uh, took a horizontal drilling and completions course, which would be formative later on. Spent some time in New Orleans living there and, and going to school. What year was that? Do you remember? Because that's like, before that, it was just drilling, vertical drilling. Yeah, then, like they, this, then they started to do the yeah, horizontal. And horizontals were already being done in the Gulf, uh, had been being done for a long time. But they weren't being done around here, were they? Yeah. Some were being done in, in Saskatchewan oh. by Shell. And some directional and stuff had been done down here in Waterton and other areas. But pretty new on um, the scene. Fairly back new. Yeah. And what was what was, hadn't happened here yet was horizontal multi-stage fracking. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening is we uh, I ran into some guys that I had known from university. And we started our own company in 1999 called Camp In Resources. Didn't really do anything with that horizontal multi-stage frack. Traditional type oil and gas. We built that and sold that. Um, and then had another company and then on the third company called pilot energy, we got, uh, involved in Southern Saskatchewan in the Bakken. and right. we'd been drilling my Dale wells down there. Um, and we'd been going through the Bakken. We could always see it. It was always about a meter that's thick. A, we talked a little bit about that a while back. Yeah. The Bakken's just like the sawtooth, same that layer. Yeah, it's, it's a thin sandstone. That's really tight, meaning it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, in order to get the oil out, you have to start kind of shatter it and crack it open. Yeah. Um, it, if you were to drill in it traditionally and perforate it in that one meter mm. or 10 meter stretch, it, it varies. Um, you'd get maybe a barrel a day out of the well. Mm -hmm. If you drilled in it traditionally horizontally and stayed in the formation, maybe you went out 800 meters, you'd get maybe 50 60 70 barrels a day of oil it's a surface area again mm. but if you go and drill it out 
and remember it's 1600 meters down in the in the earth's surface if you drill it and then you go in and fracture it at the toe 10 meters back another frack another frack and these are small fracks they're not they go out they propagate out about maybe 80 meters oh, on yeah. each side of the well when you do a series of those you've increased the surface area of the well now yeah. um a thousand fold almost now you can get a five six seven hundred barrel a day well out of now it. we're talking yeah yeah so but at that point crescent point energy was doing it we were experimenting with it there's a couple other companies that were and then about almost simultaneously we both kind of figured out that holy holy crap if we frack this thing we, we're going to get some thousand barrel a day wells and we did so we kept at it and then now it's a game of being secret not talking to everybody and uh, trying to acquire much land. Loose lips, yeah, and, ships, and yeah. We ended up uh, acquiring enough land and uh, proved it up by drilling strategic wells in certain locations, and we sold the company to Crescent Point, which was nice. Oh, good. So, okay. And then they, of course, went to town. And, they went, oh, yeah. So I wouldn't say we developed the technology. I would just say that it was, I would say yeah. that that particular formation is, that's what it needed to come into the line. To make it produce. And simultaneous to this, there were people working on it in North Dakota as well. So in Saskatchewan, it hadn't quite. Then after that, we we had another oil and gas company, and we came up and tried doing it in the Cardium here uh, up by Galt Lake, Sylvan Lake. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of other companies doing it. Like the word got out. So we got one more kick at the can in the Cardium and sold that company. So Cool. Back to aviation, air yeah. shows. Tell us about uh, how you started, mm. how you got in. What, where yeah. were you? Like you're like, hey, I want to start. Yeah, I, you I, know, I, I want to start uh, doing air shows. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, you know, and the air show stuff we did was, uh, I didn't perform as much as we sort of appeared and, and would have the airplanes on display and do some a little bit of formation flying. Um, there's more talented performers than me, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, I got approached because of a medical issue. It was uh, Bruce Evans that had his T28. I didn't own one at the time. I had my Cetabria in Springbank, and he uh, needed someone to ride with once in a while because he had temporarily lost his medical with oh, a heart okay. fibrillation. So I flew in the back seat trunk with him, and we traveled across North America. We were part of a group of T28 orders in the United States that got together a couple times a year, and they would... Uh, mostly ran by ex-U.S. Navy guys that had flown them in service, and they would have these formation camps down in Concord, North Carolina, uh, California. You'd show up with the airplane. It would be one of these sort of intense five-day flying things where you'd go out and learn how to do two-ship work, three-ship, four-ship. Awesome. How um, many planes, you know, how many How many guys come with these planes? And uh, like at Concord, up? you'd have... You, you could, you, you'd have between 10 and 20 airplanes show up. Oh, There's nice. quite a few of them in the United States. And different people at different levels of skill, right? Yeah. Um, so you, you get the ex-military guys that had flown them in the service that uh, had been successful in business and could afford to buy one. And then you get guys that had been successful in business, kind of like my route, like that could get afford into, it, get, but had a bit of a background it. with, had been introduced to some sort of military structure or whatever. So then you could do that. And, and these U.S. Navy guys and U.S. Marine Corps guys don't suffer fools. Like you would show up to these... I've seen guys kicked out of the formation camp. You're out of here. It's because it's too dangerous. You can't have a guy work in your wing that you can't trust. So can't, we did a lot of work. There can be no that. sloppiness. Yeah, and yeah. and there's there's room for learning, but it was very structured. Always, mm-hmm. you always had an IP in the back seat. Um, you'd start out doing two ship stuff, getting close, learning station changes, all the all the stuff you yeah. need to do, and then you would work up to be a four ship a four ship lead or whatever. So I got as far as as being in a four ship as uh, number three cool. in work in the slot. I never got to be a lead. I didn't go that far yeah. um, because it, it's one of those processes where those it only happens twice a year. Those guys that are in the lead are like superstars, right? Yeah, it's hard. I, I've led two ships for sure. Yeah. And, it, and that's, you know, you, that's difficult. It's, yeah. uh, it gives you a new appreciation when you see the snowbirds fly with nine airplanes. There's a lot going on. And there's a lot of, you have to have some real high acumen people on your wing. Oh, yeah. So. So that was how that started. Cool. And then because we were the, I think at the time, I guess there's only five flying T-28s in Canada. And of that, probably about three that were active, we would take the airplanes to air show. I ended up buying one 
and we would go to air shows and uh, you know cool show the airplane stuff. off and do all that. And at the same time, I started volunteering and working with Vintage Wings of Canada out in Gatineau, Quebec, um, flying their Tiger Moth and their Stearman with a group of other people, and uh, we took those airplanes on the road. In fact, we took the Stearman and the Cornell from Gatineau, Quebec, all the way out to uh, Vancouver, across Canada. So that was took a scarf, those were epic took trips. A big coat with you and a big yeah. scarf. <laughs> Cornell had a heater. <laughs> the Stearman didn't have a heater. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that that was fun, and we broke it up into. They're cold on a on a warm day. Yeah, yeah, because well, it gets cold up there. It does. Yeah. And I, me and another guy that's at Weston now, Dave Merrick, we took it from Ottawa all the way to Calgary. And you got what an hour's worth of fuel? You better be yeah, looking for some more. I think it was two six, hours max. Thirty-six gallons, I remember, in the tank. But I, yeah, yeah we. I remember we did Ottawa to uh, Sudbury, Sudbury to Wawa, Wawa to Thunder Bay across the top of the lakehead, Thunder Bay um, to Kenora for a quick gas stop, Kenora to it's Winnipeg. A long, it's a long trip in a barren. I've definitely went <laughs> from here to Toronto in a barren. It was a long day. What I told, <laughs> what I would tell people, we followed the Trans Canada Highway in case you had an engine failure, but, um, it's like the world's sort of biggest Harley. You're yeah, in this thing, open cockpit, sure. the wind's in your face. You're not really much higher than a Harley is on the road, yeah. <laughs> and you're kind of flying around. But it was, that was... rattling uh, and making all sorts of noises, yeah. and there's oil leaking, and there's... It was yeah. a great experience. I mean, I, I, I'm I, glad I did it. It's totally. I think there's very few people that get to do that. And then we took them through the Canadian Rockies, through Rogers Pass and all that. Over Highway 1. Basically, yeah. all the way out there. Um, I didn't do all of that leg. I did some of it in the Cornell. Same kind of thing, though. But that's mountain flying, as you know, where you uh, you, you don't have the, the performance to go over. So you, you really got to watch your weather and have some turn points. So we, we briefed it. and uh, I've locked out every time so far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Roger's Pass can be nasty, right? There's People a, think I'm crazy, but yeah. I just go up and I go over. Yeah, if the airplane has the performance yeah, and you've got it, some... It just has enough, I think. Yeah, and your fear runs out of... I did a 170... I took a 172 to Whitefish. Yeah. To Kalispell, and it at 11,000 feet. No, it's pretty That's all it would go. do. It yeah. wouldn't do any more. Yeah. And I was like, it would climb, basically. So you're 1,000 feet above the topography. Yeah, and then, Yeah, so there's things to think about there, but those were, those were good experiences, and... Uh, and it was a fun time of my life to do oh, that. Totally. I don't know if I have the drive to do it now. But you got to be young, young yeah. and tough. Yeah, and it's, you know, as you know, with flying, it's the flying part's great, but there's a lot of prep and there's a lot of putting to bed of airplanes, and especially mm -hmm. if you're transiting and you're, you know. Yeah. I know when I fly to go to Whitefish or go to Vancouver or go to Friday Harbor, my sister lives in Friday yep. Harbor, I do a direct shot there. Because they have customs there, because they have right. a ferry terminal there, so it works out good. But it's at least I got a half a day of planning if I want to cross the border mm -hmm. with the EAPIS and yep. and need to do weather briefings and yep. figure it all out. And to do it right, it takes a long long time. Yeah, it's a simple two and a half hour flight to Vancouver, but there's probably six hours of figuring things out. Well, and it's it's the it's the people that don't plan and take the time to re yeah. re plan and look at maps and look at weather. It's those are the people that sometimes get in trouble. Yeah. So I think it's you and have I'm, to treat it that way. And we got this uh, what we call it the eastern slopes out yep. here. That's a, that's the only part that gets me a little bit of upslope uh, weather with that's where fog. I, and, yeah. yeah. I leave first thing in the morning. Yeah. Or at night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's but right. middle at noon? No. Yeah. Not well, around here. The temperature dew point can close just like that. Yeah. And as soon as those two meet, it'll just be instant fog. Yeah. Absolute, no, and then you're in trouble. Real. So. Um, your first airplane was a Cessna 140. Yeah, that's right. Yours you, was a 120. Yeah. 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 Same, same airplane. Yeah. You had flaps. Did they work? Did the flaps do much? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> they made noise. <laughs> <laughs> they were, I, heard, uh, I heard some pilots say they didn't really make not a really. difference. I mean, I, it, you could have flown. I had a ragwing one. Mine was not metal. It was yeah. a 140A ragwing. Not that that really matters. Uh, the flaps were sort of effective. Uh, they were more effective if they were down and you side slipped because yeah. you had a little bit of surface a area. A little bit hanging. more. So I think I remember... 
correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, but did you buy that and then like go fly the shit out of it all over the place? Like I bought it to like Florida or something? No, that airplane didn't go that far. I flew all over Western Canada with it for sure. Um, I bought it. I got a line of credit to buy it the day that I bought it. I was with my buddy flying back and uh, the engine went by Gleeson. I bought it in Pence, Saskatchewan, <laughs> landed in a farmer's field. And uh, the hardest part of that, because we were glider pilots, it was kind of a non-event actually, but the, uh, well, was keeping the, cat- the ground. keeping the cattle away from it, from rubbing it. Now I flew that airplane for about five years and uh, purchased a... I guess the next airplane was a Cherokee 140 with partners in Springbank. Flew that around, good like little, down into Montana. Airplanes. Yeah, pretty beat up little airplane, yeah. but it, we did a lot of flying in it. Yeah. And then purchased a Musketeer. And that airplane we, we took into the U.S. frequently. So mostly North, like all North American flying, yeah. for sure. And then after that, I bought a Grumman Yankee. And that airplane traveled a lot. It was actually fairly... They're pretty quick, aren't they? Fairly zippy. Yeah. I think it was a 120 knot airplane, 110 knot good. airplane for that category of airplane. Um, yeah, that was good. And then a Texas tail dragger. Um, and I, that, that airplane was tricky, but I did fly it a lot. Squirrely, is that what they call yeah. it? A lot squirly. of guy ones. Yeah, squirrely for sure. Tail heavy. The 150 airframe isn't really designed. The, the main gear placement is, uh, makes it tail heavy. Yeah. So when I got my 120, they put these little extenders little extenders yeah. just to get that wheel those the yeah. mains just up a little bit i don't know if they help i think they do you talk to guys uh, mine had the heel like the gear everybody extenders. said get them so oh God. i yeah. i couldn't say otherwise i've never flown yeah. a stock one but um out of all those planes which one would you want to have back yeah it's kind of a multi-phase answer if i could have I, I think I'd like to have my Comanche 250 back out of yeah. all the ones I have. I, I really like that plane. That's a traveling airplane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that airplane too. I've flown it a, uh, one in Red Deer a little bit. Uh, for efficiency and operating costs and speed, I'd bring back the Grumman A1B Yankee. Um, it was an airplane that was cheap to own. I bought it for $11,000 Canadian. No one would fly them because they, they, you got to fly them fast on approach. The, their stall characteristics are a little tricky. You just got to fly over the fence at what, like seven miles an hour or something. Just keep it hot and then bleed off okay. the speed. They don't. You can't recover. You can't get them into that behind the power curve slow oh, flight yeah. regime. They're not. They're nasty that way. But if you fly them right, they're great. Um, I like that airplane. Um, I'd love to have the T twenty eight back, but I, you know that that time has gone. I miss the the speed and the. It was a fun airplane. I think hauled ass, right? That's an 1800 horsepower, or sorry, 1400 horsepower yeah. uh, R 1820. So you I briefly mean, told me one day, like your it cruises at a wicked speed, right? Well, it, it like it's not jet like speeds. It's close. I mean, it, it, sort of close. I mean, it, it it pops around at 250 knots. Yeah, that's moving. So you can you can get up there. I think the the thing the Navy liked about it so much is that the way you fly it is really similar to managing a turbojet. So, for example, in T-33, like, you can't throttle stroke. You can overheat them, overtemp them really quickly. You've got to... The same thing with the radial engine. you got to make your power adjustments very judiciously. And you got to cool it off, too. You yeah, cooling's just... a huge thing. It's not... You can't just chop the power. So I miss that airplane because it, it opened up a bigger world of oh, formation for sure. flying aerobatics and it was very pleasant and had yeah. the power to recover and, and do all that. Um, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with that decision of not doing it because, uh, it required a lot of care and feeding. You had to have the oh, right runway length. You got to have a really big hangar. Like, so your whole infrastructure changes, right? Yeah. So the truth is the Cetabria now is, uh, is a good little compromise airplane. It's relatively fast fun, and it's aerobatic and it's modern yeah. and it's fun to fly and it keeps you in the it's game not 50 so. years old like yeah. everybody else's airplane <laughs> that's true <laughs> um let's touch on uh it was like my birthday you got you and sally were here and it was like the big release of this uh hold the dark oh yeah and you guys missed it to come to my birthday or something like that i think oh, so yeah. i watched it the next day it was an awesome movie Super yeah, violent, pretty, but yeah, pretty violent. Let's touch. Yeah, I was just like, wow, that's a, that's quite a show. But so they, you get a call from somebody one day, and they're like, hey, we got a 
we need to, we need a guy to fly a, a 180 around here or, or do you know these people from before or how no. how that all work uh that connection i'm trying to think of how that all came about i got a i think i got a call through uh a couple of the guys that had T28s out on the coast and these guys were filming in alberta and wanted to do some aerial work so i kind of considered it and we we wondered you know you got to be careful what you say yes to because especially in the movie part of it what they envision airplanes being able to do and what actually is capable can be quite different um so we went and met with the producers here in calgary and then uh they wanted a cessna a 180. In fact, they didn't know what they wanted. So you have, that's the difficult part of taking. They don't know the capabilities or what, what purpose a 180 has over. They have a look in mind. And so you had to, so we sort of had to pitch them on what airplane would work best for the role. So the movie involved flying through the mountains, some mountain flying. And then we had to do multiple takeoffs and landing on a frozen lake as part of the script. That was cool. Yeah. So there, we ended up, getting leasing a 180 and uh, got an air show pilot out of rocky mountain house ken fowler to fly and i safety piloted in the right seat oh, okay and doubled the other guy so it was a kind of a two-man job um from the standpoint it's nice to have a safety pilot to make sure everything because you, you it involves formation flying with the helicopter for the air-to-air sequence another set of eyes right yeah if you need yeah them. so you want someone who's done some formation and you want someone who is comfortable in that airframe type. And then the ice landings required a little bit of dilly-dally because you had, for lack of a better word, you had to simulate a crash. So you come in and you induce a ropey landing. I know that. Right? I know it shows those big tires. Were, yeah. were they Tundra tires or just yeah, big they tires? Were, they were Tundra I remember tires. that landing. was like, boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom. And that was on and that, purpose? Those were intentional. Yeah. yeah I mean, you, you, could land, you could land. I hope we could land the airplane better than that. <laughs> I was, it was kind of a rough landing. But, <laughs> but, but we were knows? asked to do that, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. So, and that all sounds easy, but it takes multiple takes and we're operating remotely. So fuel's an issue. For you sure. got to have enough left to transit. Um the directors tend to get into a sequence where let's do it one more time. Let's do it one more time. And they think it's and easy. You, and you got to be strong enough to say, no, we're out of time. We're out of gas. Tomorrow. Um, yeah. And that's the hard part with sort of the movie. I, I don't like calling it stunt flying. Everybody wants to please everybody and keep on going. Yeah. Okay. You got to be gotta, careful you gotta with say it. No. And in a second thing that we did called the detour where we, uh, a TV show called the detour where we had the airplane taking off with Sally actually in a Jeep going head to head where we actually filmed and then we take off over top of the Jeep, which in the actual moment, she's stationary and we took, we did a high speed pass and came over. We never actually accelerated. Just looks (laughs) multiple takes, right. And, and all that. But, uh, Example, one of the things that came up there, we were filming at CL Ranch out by Springbank on a gravel road landing the airplane. And one of the things that comes up immediately, it's August. It was during the forest fire season, right? They're so extremely hot. Um, density altitude came up mm. as a performance issue. And they wanted us to take off upslope towards a small rising hill. So we just said, we had to be, and they were, they had it all set up. There was a lot of pressure to do and it. It's three in the afternoon. You have to say, yeah. no, can't do it. Yeah. We can do it in the morning, maybe. Yeah, which is how we did it. Yeah. You change uh, late evening or early morning flying. But that the hard part of um, working in an aerial unit when you're doing that stuff is you got to parlay that to the guys that don't understand it, aircraft performance issues. You got to give them a little education on how this yeah. thing works. Pe- most people don't have a clue. No, yeah. it's not like, taking your truck and driving it on the road. So those are the challenges. I, I find that the challenge, professionally, the challenge in taking those on is knowing when to say no, being strong enough to say no, and also you know, also understanding which ones you should take on at all. Right. Because some of it's just too wild. Like some of it, some of it should be CGI, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> Versus <laughs> what, what an airplane can actually do. Yeah. We, you've all watched, as a pilot, you've watched aviation movies where the airplane's turning or it's yawing or, and you go, that's ridiculous. Airplanes don't fly like that. Right. So (laughs) there's a fine line between parlaying those two. So the, the movie and TV work is, is interesting, but fun though, right? It is fun. I mean, we, we finished, uh, we finished one in November in Montreal. Um, it'll be coming out 
um, Remembrance Day next year, the Battle of Midway. So spent some time coaching actors and people in the cockpit on that. So those ones are easier because you you don't have to fly. <laughs> <laughs> I see on that Hold the Dark. They had did they have it set up on jacks or something or or yeah. a hydraulic well, system actually, so it could so when you're inside it would simulate. Yeah, you can you can you can set up a sawhorse to do that. On in this case, what we did is we went to Calgary Crane Stampede Crane. Oh yeah, we brought a crane out. The airplane was rigged for floats with the eyelets oh, okay. to lift so it up to put it on floats. Put the slings on there, kind so of things. We, 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 or cable. Yeah, we lifted up on the uh, four the four lifting points yeah. and had the actors about you know three feet off the ground and simpler than you would think. You set up, they set up the cameras such they could see west of High River with the Rockies and the sky and the sun. And then you have ropes on the tie down points and you get guys on the ground to They're doing the in, old... induce yaw, roll, whatever, yeah. right? That's cool. So Hollywood, they, yeah, they trick us every Hollywood time. Hollywood and high, <laughs> high River. Yeah. Um, I wanted to. Everybody asks me, okay, there's VFR flying, there's IFR flying. I'm not an IFR guy. No, I don't even, I don't fly, we don't, I don't fly. IFR. You don't do it? No. Oh, I thought you did. No, I, uh, I'll fly VFR on top. Uh, with yeah. the T-28, I treated it with kid gloves. I was, uh, I always felt that unless the airplane is capable of handling no one icing or some sort of icing, I don't mm. know if you have any business. There's certain types of IFR that I think can be really dangerous. In that 414 like that. I fly in with my friend Jimmy, Jim, we call him Jimmy the Jet, Jimmy McKinnon. It's, you can fly in a no one ice with that and baby. That. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, it's a good thing it does. Yeah. Because we wouldn't have made it. I don't think. That's, I, I think that I've felt personally that in this category of airplane and because I'm doing it for fun and because I don't really need to be there that I just don't mm. do that. I don't maintain it. I don't. And it keeps me caged into a certain avenue of flying. I'm, a, I'm in the same boat. But it's, CFR on top, like a little bit of, like it's nice to have an attitude indicator. And if you have mm -hmm. to uh, maybe go through a little bit of cloud or something like that, those yeah. are all very legal things and fine. And, uh, you know, you just pick your days. I, my personal philosophy is a uh, hundred dollars a night at the super eight is m and a beer and go to bed is <laughs> much steak. better than and a steak <laughs> is much better than sweating it out. In we a always, situation we like always that. say it's better to be on the ground wishing you're in the air than being in the air wishing you're on the ground. That's right. Having and, you've all, everyone's been there where you just don't like your situation uh, and it's a, uh, yeah. it's a bad feeling. So it's real yeah. bad. I know. I know. Bad. so mitigate risk right yeah for sure learn how to read the weather and it's so much easier nowadays i mean when i was a young kid in the 80s flying um you would have to get the area forecast would be written out in text and mm -hmm. it's all coded like it's all truncated words right i couldn't so you read to, one right now it's 20, I, I don't think, 20, 20 don't years I ago could. i could but not today and a friend of mine a guy named brett belsner who's at WestJet now taught me he he had a copy of western canada with a map that had all the airport reporting stations on it. Oh. And you would sit down and make you read the TAF, the area, it was actually called an area forecast. Terminal area forecast, it, but there was an back area. Then it was just called area forecast, the as I recall. Yeah, and you'd read through it, and it would be, it would say things like, a front lies 20 miles south of uh, Saskatoon, running east, northeast to, I'm making it up, to York oh, yeah, or something like sure. that. And you would draw the front in, the front is moving at 20 knots to the southeast, and you draw the arrow. Like you would create your own uh, interpretation GFA. of that information that they're giving or that coding that they're giving you. Yeah, and so that you had a map to understand what weather systems you're going to encounter en route. Now that's called the GFA. You yeah. go, you go on to the forecast. website and yeah. you can see six hours, 12 hours, and so on. I know. Technology's on It's all driven. It's all, uh, it's all already. Uh, prognosted that gets written out for you yeah. in a graphical format and not only that you can be airborne with four flight now in the airplane boom i can bring up the most recent one while i'm airborne these yeah. things didn't exist oh no i i gotta believe that radar didn't exist like the ability to look at predictive radar in flight in that category of now airplane. we can see well yeah uh, moisture yeah, cloud heights. We get like a two. What is there like two minute delay or something yeah. nowadays? If you're running all the bells all and whistles, that, yeah. so I, you know, I I sometimes look back and I go, you know, I wonder how many guys 
wouldn't have been killed if they would have had that data. For sure. But well, there's the biggest one. That's the one that yeah. that gets me all the time, and I, and I'm always, once in a while, you gotta push it to get ahead of it, or, yeah. or else you're gonna be buggered. Like, yeah. I flew back from one, one time I was flying from Fort McMurray. I had this old 172. I'd fly it up there for do my two week hitch, and then I'd fly it yeah. home. And, so you know how that, how predictable that's gonna be. Or yeah. It I had to stay up there a few times, and I had to take WestJet back. But yeah. I was flying home, wicked. Uh, dark thunderstorm cold west of me yep it's moving east i'm going to cold lake or i'm going to uh i couldn't make it home i wasn't going to make it through that storm yeah. the storm's ahead of me so i'm talking to edmonton center maybe. yeah and i got permission to go through the cold lake uh, oh, restricted true, true. airspace right i had to just take a little corner go through a little bite a little corner of it to get to bonneville yeah but if i wouldn't have said hey i need to get through there i don't i don't like it would have made her yeah it was very close sometimes you gotta ask that's right well that's the biggest thing yeah don't be afraid to ask that's right <laughs> that's where i think everybody gets a little embarrassed you run into a problem and you're like oh i could do this without just ask yeah that's the that's best right. advice i can give anybody just well, ask. And the the valuable one in canada and the u.s is flight following if you can do I vfr flight, flight following. following i do it often I get a feeling, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they like doing it up here. In the States, they're all about it. Yeah, they. I know in the States, they'll refuse it if they're really busy, et cetera. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, I guess I... I yeah, do it here I, all the time, I'll, but it seems like... The, I talk to pilots that never even heard about it before. Yeah. I'm like, what? You don't use flight following? I love flight following. Yeah, there seems to be a bit more pushback or a bit of a maybe a union attitude sometimes with those guys. But you know what? You're paying for it, so ask. Um, Somebody, I pay my fee there. I get it all the time. So I, I view it as it's a service. It's a service. I, I totally agree. If they want to say no, that's fine. But I uh, love it. Yeah. They step, they, they forward you on to the next frequency yeah. and the next yeah. center. And The only thing that will happen with that occasionally because of, because it's Canada and because there's so much geogra geography is uh, you'll run out of radar coverage. You'll be too low sometimes. When, I, they, they when I make a hop in Vancouver, it's just like... I think I'm just west of Kelowna where I'll run out. You'll lose it, yeah. And I can't talk to them on the radio. Yeah. But I bounce off of uh, Air Canada or You can pick them up on guard, those guys on 21.5. Yeah. Or uh, that's another handy thing that a lot of general aviation guys don't use, and I've done it for lots, is I'll just... Those guys are doing... They're, they're always... They're having a coffee, and they're listening to 21.5 on guard. Yeah. And you can always get them to relay. They'll do that Oh, sometimes. I know. It's totally awesome. So. They're happy. Most of those guys have been in that situation, flying in the bush or something, yeah. so they're happy to do it. Oh, yeah. Relay they're, a message to and the Pacific Radio Corps. They probably can't wait. Yeah. Give something, something to, to do. do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But, uh, oh, yeah. Well, how about a two-minute break? Okay, let's... Uh, I want to learn a little bit and explain to us just a little bit about aerobatics. Yeah. How... Uh, I guess when did you, when did that when did you get that bug and tell us about how you learned it and how you've been keeping up practicing doing it. Yeah, for sure. I uh, I don't know. I probably had the bug all along, but the formal training that I did, I did. And we talked about it earlier at Harbs Air in Winnipeg, St. Andrews. Sorry, not St. Andrews. Uh, outside of Winnipeg, Can't, it escapes me right now. They've got a little strip out there, totally gravel good. strip. So um, I went out there and just immersed myself in it and did the sportsman's course. So there's sort of these informal things in aerobatics. There's sportsman, intermediate, advanced, and all that. And I did the sportsman basic course uh, in the Cetabria and uh, learned from Luke Penner, the son of uh, Harv Penner. Harv. That's the guy. Yeah. That's Harv's air, right? Steinbeck is the name of this airstrip. Um, so I did basic aerobatics there. So that's... And in the Cetabria is actually a pretty good airplane to learn on because you have to do a lot of energy management. It, it's... It's not stellar at aerobatics. It doesn't have an endless amount of power. You yeah, so gotta... you're climbing and you're recovering in between maneuvers. But you can do everything in the Cetabria except tail slide it. So um, you can do the loop, the roll, the barrel roll, any any type of roll. You can do a snap roll, um, hammerhead, uh, Cuban 8s, the whole nine yards, right? So it's actually a pretty good airplane to learn in. And I've just kept it up by doing that and taking the odd course along the way. Like I did a formal T-28 course with one of the pilots down in Concord um, 
uh, North Carolina, uh, because yeah. energy management there's a little different. The the big thing with those bigger kinetic energy airplanes is uh, you got to be really careful with coming off the top end. Like the split S is the big air show killer, right? Where guys will roll and pull. It winds up way faster. And then than you're you doing that full. End. Yeah, and that's where they like. I I remember at Vintage Wings, our chief pilot was a very high SA guy, and he uh, he sort of forbid any. Uh, just don't directed, go there. directed energy towards the ground so to display the airplane you'd come along and and maybe do a roll like that in front of the crowd but you're not pointing directly at the ground mm-hmm. and if you need to do reversals you'd come out and maybe come up and do a cuban a half cuban so over the top but then roll back level yeah um this business of pointing straight at the ground in you, any you're doing situation this. and they're trying it yeah and there's a lot of coffin corners or your yeah. perception your perception of distance and speed and how much altitude remaining can get skewed. For it happens sure. fast. And some of these airplanes, you run out of the aerodynamic authority to get out of it. The, the curve takes you into the ground. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's something you want to avoid. Now, you can do a split S at altitude. You can do it in the Cetabria at altitude. But split you, S, you, explain to me what that is. Uh, so a split S would be where you roll the airplane and pull. Okay. Right? Uh, whereas... Uh, Immelman would be a loop over the top and okay. come out like that. Uh, standard loop is like that. Uh, a standard aileron roll is about the axis of the airplane like that. Yeah. A barrel roll is a combination of a loop and a roll. So it, it traces the outside of a, a barrel like a corkscrew. So you'd kind of come like this and you come up All right. uh, over the side so that it, it's a bigger it's arc. A corkscrew. Yeah, that's right. At the end of the day. Hammerhead is pull up to the vertical, and just before the stall, you rotate. Come straight Full back Full rudder down. that gets you. Yeah, and actually a little point. bit, a little bit of opposite aileron because you get the okay. secondary effect of controls, right? Yeah, kicks in, and there's a little torque there too. Um, probably missing a few here. Snap roll is you actually pull the airplane aggressively mm-hmm. back, and it spins in the horizontal, so it spins about this wing. Mm-hmm. So instead of spinning traditionally like that, you're spinning it in the horizontal. It's uh, so those are the the basic ones, but every airplane's a little bit different, right? And like I said, the T twenty had a lot of kinetic energy, so you had to be very careful. People, a lot of people have been killed in the vertical in that. <coughs> what did that plane weigh? Uh, empty was eight thousand ish pounds. That's pretty heavy. Full up uh, with fuel and in, in in its war war mode in Vietnam, for example, you'd be as high as thirteen thousand pounds. That's pretty I heavy. I think it was thirteen. So. Six and a half tons flying through there. Yeah, it's a lot, right? Yeah. Full fuel. I, I mean, I think we were around 95, 9,800 pounds. But yeah. yeah. And so the good news on that airplane is that you didn't have to climb between maneuvers. It would typically maintain its uh, altitude. Where's the tab where you have to do that? Start climb up the stairs again and then yeah. let's do it again and then yeah. bleed it back. And up. actually, that's pretty good training. It gives yeah. you, you know, there's there's very few people that want to go out and just bang around <laughs> at, and yeah. in the three to four G regime. Yeah. It's for, hard. It's hard on the body, minutes. hard on the brain. Yeah. It's hard on your head. It's tiring. If you're not actually doing the flying, it's as a passenger and instructor, it can be difficult because you don't know when they're going to induce the G. I went. So when I was taking my flight training at high river, they had a couple of Zlins there. Yes. Zlin yeah. 242, I yeah. think it was. I, right. I was trained, I trained on a 142, but they had a 242 yeah. there. It was brand new yeah. from Czechoslovakia, I think. Yeah. Anyways, we t- I went up with the instructor. I said, let's, let's go with that thing. And we went up and did a hammerhead and the loop de dupes and all yeah. that stuff. And I'm just like, I need to go to, the, you got to take me yeah. back. And that's normal. I took two steps of that thing and just like, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> like fed the crows. I did. I think I did my <laughs> first my head day. Hurt, my head hurt for a whole day. Yeah. Because of the G's. Yeah. It was like, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's irresponsible. I mean, it, if you're against it instruction, a little quick. it's, you, you probably, as an instructor, if people want to go and do aerobatics, whenever I've done it in the past, first of all, you got to be recovered by 2,000 feet above, like you respect all the altitude requirements. Yeah. Um, usually a couple maneuvers is fine. Like, a nice aileron roll, maybe a loop, and then do it at the end of the flight and then land because you don't, you know, that that inner ear moving around when sure. catches up with people. For so. sure. It, it's an aggressive environment, right? And I, to see people do hardcore aerobatics for a long time, like I, I, 
I don't do that. I'm I'm into gentlemen's aerobatics. I don't, yeah, it's. Uh, I I've taken. There's got to be. I love taking people flying. I've probably taken like 100 or yep. 150 people up over the years. It some people just can't do it. They're they're sick within five minutes. Yeah, <laughs> puking everywhere. Yep. I'm like, oh like, man. <laughs> yeah, the inner ear is. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, some people just don't like small and close. Some spaces. people get seasick. Even just, I think, even just the, even the smell in the plane. Like you get a little bit of the ab yeah. gas smell, a little bit of exhaust, yeah. noise, and confinement. Yeah, yeah, it makes people it makes people sick. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't. It's never bothered me, I yeah. guess. But I, yeah, that's that's the aerobatic background and I still try to do as much as I can. I mean, I try to be current at it. I'll go up probably once a month as a minimum and yeah. go through a sequence of everything. Have, I'm, I shouldn't say this, but I don't keep track of my overall hours very often, but you got how many hours you figure you got? Oh, about 3000 ish. I think there's good. uh I haven't updated my personal log for a little bit. With the, with I the busted a thousand so. last year. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. It's a good it, milestone. It is good, and yeah. you know you got to look at the type of flying you're doing. I mean, if there's multiple takeoffs and landings in a given cycle of an hour, that's a pretty uh, noteworthy hour. It's of a busy flying. hour. As with aerobatics, those are busy hours where there's a lot of yeah. uh, um, hands-on, higher acumen flying happen. If you're transiting, uh, it's not as busy as you know, yeah. right? So yeah. hours can be somewhat deceiving. I mean. Uh, it depends totally. on the quality and nature of the hours matter a lot, but you know, I, I think I'm, I think I'm at coming up to 3000 ish. Yeah. That's awesome. So, but that's over a long time too. Right. So 20, yeah, I got a thousand hours in 20 years or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the WestJet guys, airline guys will be 300 hours a month or something. Yeah. Like they're that, getting right? 14 so, or 1500 a year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's just the nature of the work. Driving right? the bus. Yeah. So yeah. That's good. That's, that's good. Air races, Reno air races. Ever go to that? Yeah, I've been to. Do any air racing? No, I've never done any air racing. Didn't get a ride along. No, never done a a ride along. I've been I've been to the event. I got it's good. good. The uh, it's worth seeing. I I guess I would probably encourage people to go sooner than later. There is talk. You think they're going to cancel them or slow them down? It's it's expensive, and uh, a lot of those Merlins in the Mustangs and so on are burning out. Right, like the it might not be around forever. Another yeah. really good show is Chino, California. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Um, the T-33 that I'm helping out is the Canada airplane, and the Pace airplane for Reno that, that they open it with is the T-33. Bob Hoover used to fly that. Nice. And that's, uh, you'll see that down in Chino as well. So, yeah. Where, uh, where can we keep track of you this summer? What, what, what are the big air shows you're going to be at with the, with the 33? Yeah, I'll be helping out. Um, Scratch, Rob Mitchell does all the, the air display flying and I transit with him. And the airplane requires quite a bit of care and feeding on the ground, especially fueling it and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, we're doing two in the United States coming up. Uh, Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, followed by Redlands, California, which is San Bernardino area by Los Angeles. And then in Canada, we're doing Moose Jaw, the Moose oh, Jaw good. Air Show, which is, I think it's the weekend of the back, fourth. Back fourth. at the home where it all started. Yeah, back home yeah. to bring the airplane there. And then from there, we go to Great Falls, Montana, oh, which nice. is the weekend after, I believe it's 14, 15 July. Uh, okay. And then there's some more dates in September, but we get a bit of a break in August. So cool. Great Falls sh- should be an interesting show. And it's probably the closest we'll get to Alberta. Right. Although I guess in a, it will be in Edmonton. I won't be there. What's so. your role when you're, when you're in the air flying that are you doing a lot? You're saying you do a lot of the fuel management because it has so many fuel tanks and all that. Or, Just a second or, set of eyes. Another set I of mean, eyes the, as the well. The airplanes are, are, the cockpits are relatively old in them. The avionics mm-hmm. are kind of, uh, they're, they're good. They're, they're a little bit limited. Um, I'll run for flight in the back to keep track of where we are. I have my maps. Yeah. It's good to have a second set of eyes. Often we'll split the flying from the standpoint is one guy will fly, the other guy will handle the radios gotcha. and, uh, you know, talk to center and all that. Um, and yeah, I keep a good eye on fuel. The T-33 is interesting because it has the, the fuel gauge it does has only reflects the tank behind the second pilot. Everything feeds into that header tank. Oh, okay. So the only 
way you know your tip tanks are out of fuel is you get a warning light in the cockpit that they're they're out. Then you got to switch. The front guy's got to switch them to the next set of tanks, the leading edge, and then the mains, and finally the fuselage tanks. So. Yeah. In these up, the upgraded airplane, we actually know our fuel flow per hour, but you don't actually have one master fuel gauge that yeah. tells you exactly what you got. So yeah, keep an eye on that. You do, and the only the only thing you do have that's helpful is you can put in your total pounds into a countdown timer, a totalizer, and it'll click off as you fly. Yeah. And, and that's actually fairly accurate. You get to know the airplane after a while, but it it's a little unnerving at first not For to sure. have. Uh, but like you've always been taught. With any airplane, I'm sure your 140 had the bounce and Scott fuel gauges. <laughs> Until they and don't it's bounce. All about the watch, right? They, they do this, yeah. yeah. Ding, ding, ding. And yeah. then you better. And be then it looking. goes nothing. Yeah. So, it's time in your tanks, and you try yeah. to plan legs that are, you know, anything up to two hours. The airplane's okay, and you're going to be probably okay. But after two hours, you probably don't want to. Yeah. And the two ten, I'm like three hours, and then yeah, you only got an hour. Eight. You might have an hour left. Yeah, it's judicious fuel yeah. planning yeah. to avoid any perturbations. And they should take the <laughs> they should take the fuel gauges right out of a Cessna anyway. They're yeah, useless. Well, <laughs> They're empty. It shows yeah. a quarter, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> the the float gauges don't. Yeah. So it it's time in your tanks, and if you, I've never had problems if I've ran by the. By the way, if you want to end your tanks to end off a discussion, one of the you know you hear lots about all the fancy pilot watches and the two thousand dollar Breitlings and all that. I got to tell you, it's always been what I've always reverted to the fifty dollar Timex. I want to know the local time. I want to know Zulu time on the inside, and I want to count up and a countdown timer. Yep. So take off the stopwatch is running, and I'll put a limit in there of let's say two hours before. On a countdown, and I'll start that. And if that thing's beeping, and the other stopwatches, it t- like those are your visual indicators, yes. and you've got Zulu time. That's a fifty dollar watch. So <laughs> any pilots out there, I, I always uh, always say, hey, you don't anything need else is just to show watch. off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's like it's like a panel. Yeah, that's right. Doesn't make your airplane go any faster, but it costs a yeah, it costs a lot of money. That's right. Yeah, cool. Okay, buddy. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks for, for having the me. Time. In. Awesome. It was nice to chat with you. Thank you, you very bet. much.